On April 1, 2014, we met with Mike Bickle and the leadership of the International House of Prayer in Kansas City with the mediation of the Midwest Ministers Fellowship under the leadership of Howard Cordell. In that meeting, we presented an introductory set of concerns which we both individually and collectively hold concerning IHOPKC, its leadership, and its spiritual culture. This analysis was compiled in a document entitled, A Collection of Grievances and Concerns. At the end of that meeting, we presented Bickle and his leadership with seven signs of good faith, what we considered the minimum overtures that are necessary for us to further engage in this dialogue. Believing that Mike Bickle and the leadership of IHOPKC have responded to our concerns in good faith. On September 27, 2014, Bickle sent IHOPKC's official response to all seven of these signs, as well as documentation of new practices and procedures at IHOPKC and IHOPU, corresponding to signs 3, 4, 5, and 6. This response was included in the October 8, 2014 version of the Midwest Ministers Fellowship Report. We applaud the extensive work going into these practices and procedures and eagerly hope they will be fully beneficial in bringing about the types of changes we desire to see. We hope, with these safeguards in place, IHOPKC will develop to be a safe place for all individuals, that greater measures of accountability will result, and abuses of power stifled. There is, we feel, striking significance in the signs of good faith IHOPKC put in place, the way they were adapted, and the rationale behind them. Significantly, those signs of good faith adopted, with the exemption of one, had to do with putting in place procedures and practices that should be in place for any organization the size and scope of IHOPKC. Moreover, we lack the ability to assess the effectiveness and scope of these changes. They are beneficial systems on paper, but their worth is in the manner of their implementation. Given the manner of the response, we are struck most not by the extent to which these signs of good faith were implemented, but rather by the apparent failure to understand the necessity of their implementation. Mike Bickle and his leadership team have gone about the adoption of standard human resource practices that should be in place at any organization of IHOPKC size and scope, but have failed to express a deep introspective understanding of the underlying systemic beliefs, practices, and environment which makes these drastic changes so necessary. It is this difference of assessment that ultimately undergirds our reading of IHOPKC's response to the seven signs. There is a fundamental difference in language between IHOPKC leadership and us. We are not, in our estimation, asking IHOPKC to change a few things, but rather for IHOPKC to fundamentally alter the narrative and structure that it has both been born out of and has developed. A few policy changes will not be sufficient to make IHOPKC a spiritually healthy and psychologically safe organization. What we want to see happen is systemic organization-wide changes to the fabric of the ministry which will be demanding, transformative, and costly. It is this lack of self-reflection that has informed our interactions with the mediation and our decisions going forward. Considering this, we find the following signs of good faith to our satisfaction, left unfulfilled. Furthermore, we find the spirit with which they were addressed terminally detrimental to the mediation process. In some cases, effort has been made to fulfill these signs, but it has not been in keeping with the spirit of the mediation process or the extent to which we specified. The following is our evaluation of IHOPKC's response to these signs and further instruction on the procedures by which these issues may be resolved. Sign 1. A public statement apologizing to the many people who have been mistreated and traumatized spiritually, socially, and psychologically by IHOPKC leaders and the unhealthy culture they fostered. In regard to this sign, Bickle states, Soon after our meeting, I made a public statement acknowledging that some people had been hurt by some statements made and attitudes held by some of our leaders and some of their messages and conversations. I have made that statement several other times. While Bickle has no doubt made statements about some of the deficiencies within IHOPKC, this does not fulfill our requirements for a public apology. This seems to us immediately evident by the lack of a document containing a formal statement of apology. 
We never imagined that the phrase public statement apologizing could be taken to mean anything less than a written, published, and publicly accessible statement. While we appreciate Bickle's commitment to honor the majority of our leaders who have done well in their leadership roles, we feel this desire is misplaced. We would like to recall Bickle's statements following our meeting in April that most of the information shared was new to him. This raises a difficult question as to Bickle's evaluation of his leadership team and the extent to which he refuses to implicate them in any formal acknowledgement of wrong. The degree to which Bickle has claimed extensive ignorance and thereby negligence towards the issues we raised in our April meeting makes it impossible for his assessment of the character and behavior of IHOP KC's leaders to be trusted. If Bickle truly is ignorant of the misdeeds of specific leaders, then he must personally shoulder the blame for his dire negligence. He is responsible for creating the culture where these mistreatments happened, allowing them to take place under his watch, and not paying enough attention to identify them. An acceptable apology must 1. Take the form of a written statement presented at a public weekend service and publicized, at the minimum, on IHOP KC's website. Accessible to any individual who has been associated with IHOP KC in any capacity during the past 15 years. 2. Take personal responsibility by Mike Bickle and other senior IHOP KC leaders for the gross mistreatment that has taken place at IHOP KC over the past decade and a half. 3. Include reference to the main subsections of and explicit statements regarding the issues raised within our April presentation. A. Acknowledging the systemic problems of the meta narrative. B. Addressing the issues of a discipleship of assimilation. C. Repenting and apologizing for the handling of disagreements. D. Repenting and apologizing for accusation without investigation. E. Exposing and repenting of control in domestic spheres. And F. Addressing IHOP KC's disregard for the mental health of people within their pastoral care. 4. This is undeniably necessary because apologies must be concrete and specific as appropriate, not simply acknowledging abstract weaknesses or coming up short in love and humility. This would not involve publicly acknowledging specific wrongs to specific individuals. This type of very specific apology should only be done in private, but does require specifically acknowledging the patterns of mistreatment and negligence outlined in our document. 5. Include Bickle's personal repentance and apology for his own negligence towards the behavior of his leadership, the well-being of the members of his community, and the spiritual culture which his and his leadership team's thousands of messages and tens of thousands of conversations have produced. We would like to note that in Mike Bickle's response to the seven signs of good faith, he inserted the phrase, a willingness to meet with those mistreated. This request was not included in our description of this sign nor does it reflect our desire, either at that time or currently. This was an addition by Bickle to our requested sign and does not reflect the desire of those of us involved in this mediation process. We are not interested in seeing IHOP KC meet with anyone to resolve mistreatments until they have significantly borne fruit in keeping with repentance over the course of the coming years. Absent the completion of these signs and radical systemic changes within IHOP KC, we cannot consider Mike Bickle or IHOP KC's leadership team, safe for those mistreated to meet. Sign 2. The senior leaders who have perpetrated and justified these actions need to be disciplined, including, but not limited to, a length of time out of ministry. In our evaluation of this sign, we find several issues about the way in which Bickle has approached the subject of disciplining leaders. As such, we wish to reiterate clearly that it is in the context of professional accountability, not Christian life and spirituality, that we are asking those who have perpetrated these offenses to be removed from their leadership positions for behavior unbefitting a senior leader in any field or capacity, secular or ministerial. Leadership is a privilege for the qualified, not a right. We are asking that individuals who have demonstrated themselves to be ill-suited for leadership be terminated. We would like to set straight our motivation behind this sign, because we feel Bickle has created a false dichotomy that misrepresents our motives and potentially casts our aims in a malicious light. Bickle states, 
I will only support a disciplined process that is redemptive rather than punitive. We would like to reiterate that the actions we are asking for are neither redemptive nor punitive in nature. We are asking Mike Bickle and all involved to take protective action in order to assure the safety and well-being, physical, spiritual, and psychological, of all those under IHOP KC's leadership. We believe our stories provide ample evidence that the continued leadership of these individuals is placing the well-being of IHOP KC's community in jeopardy. We want to see evidence that Bickle holds the well-being of those in his ministry above the continued positions of these leaders who have shown themselves to be unqualified. Bickle states, if Howard recommends that Stewart be rebuked publicly and sat down in ministry, then we will insist on this. Yet we wish to reiterate that we are not asking for a public rebuke or exposing of sin. We are simply asking for those leaders who have shown to be irresponsible to have their jobs terminated. Finally, regarding this sign Bickle has stated, we are willing to discipline Stewart and Shelley, but only in the context of a biblical due process that includes their accusers being brought to them. Our April presentation includes our stories regarding these leaders. In order to protect all individuals involved, these stories, including our own, stand for themselves, and many of the individuals remain anonymous. If Bickle and other IHOP KC leaders implicated in these stories wish to provide contrasting accounts of these events, they are free to do so in written form. This is the safest way for all involved to move forward. While Bickle has stated, much of this kind of communication is best done face-to-face, -face, not in emails or formal documents. But in a relational way, we must insist that this is not an option. Our highest priority is the safety and well-being of those who have been mistreated. The insistence on formal documentation and official responses is a crucial part of maintaining this priority. While we understand Bickle's desire to operate in a relational way, we must stress that the state of our existing relationship is one of distrust, suspicion, and guardedness. This formality of procedure is the only bridge by which we were willing to attempt any form of communication or corrective action. Formal and written communication is central to this process. If Bickle or IHOP KC wishes to offer defense of these leaders' conduct, they may do so in written form. This is the extent to which we can operate in trust for the foreseeable future. While we understand that this is certainly not favorable to Bickle and IHOP KC leadership, we would hope if they are, as Bickle says, serious about making the wrong things right, that they will find a way to do so. That respects the privacy and well-being of those whom Bickle and the IHOP KC leadership team have mistreated. Sign 3. A statement admitting the ambiguities, incompleteness, and potential errors of the original IHOP KC statement concerning what they knew about Tyler Deaton's group, as contrary to IHOP KC's published statement. The testimony of multiple witnesses notes that multiple senior leaders knew about cultish activities occurring in the group in the summer of 2011, rather than mid-2012. We would like to acknowledge that much has happened regarding this sign of good faith since our April meeting and the January publication of What Rolling Stone Didn't Tell You About Tyler Deaton. Much of what has come to light has confirmed the speculations of that article. We still hold that it was to a great extent the spiritually unhealthy culture and meta narrative of IHOP KC, which informed much of Deaton's theology and conduct, both in Texas at Southwestern and in Kansas City at IHOP U, and allowed him to function for so long undetected. We hold that Deaton and IHOP KC's meta narratives are functionally the same, and that Bickle's quotation at the November 12th 2012 informational meeting could be equally applied to members of Deaton's group as well as members of IHOP KC. There were people there who should have had careers. They had degrees, law degrees, but they were delivering pizza. They had given up their goals for the vision of this one man. This is the underlying thesis of what Rolling Stone didn't tell you about Tyler Deaton, the catalyst for this mediation process and the driving force behind our urgency to see the damaging meta-narrative and spiritual culture of IHOP KC drastically change. This is what we know of the Deaton situation pertaining to the ethicality of IHOP KC's actions up to now. In the summer of 2011, there was a meeting with Ed Hackett to talk about his shunning and other acts of discipline, such as taking away Bibles and taking doors off bedrooms, 
which were happening in Deaton's group. Around the same time, another member of Deaton's group reported cultish activities to IHOPU leaders. In August 2011, Stuart Greaves met with one person about the activities in Deaton's group, including shunning. Greaves and Hunley had a meeting with an individual and discussed activities in Deaton's group and determined that Greaves would meet with and follow up with Deaton as a course of action. In August 2011, Stuart Greaves met with Tyler Deaton and accused him of going the path of becoming a cult leader. In October 2011, Shelley Hunley and Sarah's son Kim met with a student and told her, I hope you knew Deaton's group was a cult and had a student leader who had joined the group and was reporting back to them everything that happened in those houses. On October 30, 2012, Bethany Deaton committed suicide at Longview Lake. On November 6, leaders from IHOP KC, including Alan Hood, David Slyker, and Shelley Hunley, moved to break up Deaton's community. On November 7, members of Deaton's group were led through a time of spiritual deliverance and exorcism with Shelley Hunley and Prisoners of Hope where a factually impossible false confession was manipulated out of Micah Moore. In the context of a psychologically compromised state during ecstatic religious activity, on November 12th, based on this inaccurate and false information, Mike Bickle publicly condemned Micah Moore as a murderer, ostracizing him from his school and spiritual community, tarnishing his reputation, and alienating him from his friends. Any statement coming from IHOP KC needs to include a full picture in line with the timeline just presented regarding what leaders knew, when they knew it, and the appropriateness of IHOP KC's behavior in response to this information. Given all that has come to light concerning the inappropriateness of the exorcism of Micah Moore, we will simply and firmly state at this juncture our absolute disapproval of the actions that IHOP KC leadership took following the death of Bethany Deaton. We state this regardless of the manner of her death and hope that all those who decided on this course of action would be reprimanded, removed from their positions of influence, and encouraged to find proper training in dealing with situations such as Deaton's death and cult exit counseling, before they attempt to operate as if they were qualified for such a role. As to anything else IHOP KC claims to know about Tyler Deaton's group, the fallacious nature of Moore's testimony calls into question the truthfulness of much of what individuals involved in Deaton's group may have said. It is to this end that we are asking for fresh transparency about the information gathered during this time, and a public statement acknowledging the misinformation, misdeeds, and unprofessionalism with which the circumstances surrounding Bethany Deaton's suicide were handled. This sign of good faith has never attempted to assert IHOP KC's responsibility to know or discern more than what they knew about Deaton's group. We merely have asserted that they should have been more honest about what they knew and when they knew it, especially when making a written statement implies they only began to know about concerning activities in mid-2012, when it was actually mid-2011 that they had this knowledge. While fulfilled to a certain level, we have reservations about the nature of IHOP KC's completion of the fourth sign. We would ask for greater transparency in this regard and a further outline of how the negative aspects of these issues are going to be corrected. Sign 4 An amended doctrinal statement that includes all non-negotiable points of doctrine or teaching. If necessary, create a different doctrinal statement for community or staff and leaders or teachers in which the category of leader or teaching will be defined in detail. If belief in the prophetic history and or the return of Christ in this or the next generation is a non-negotiable issue for staff and or leaders or teachers, it also must be included in the doctrinal statement. Despite the expansion of the doctrinal statement, we have significant reservations about the ability for individuals to coexist inside of IHOP KC while vocalizing differences of opinion with the leadership. It is our assessment that, on a whole host of issues, IHOP KC is an unhospitable environment for individuals with diverse theological views. Specifically, we have reservations about the ability for an individual to function as a leader or IHOPU faculty member, while explicitly calling into question or disbelieving parts of the prophetic history, i.e., doubting Bickle's journey to heaven, considering the 500 to 5,000 of false prophecy, 
remaining suspicious of the coming of the angel Gabriel, etc. As the section meta narrative in A Collection of Grievances and Concerns outlines, we have serious concerns about the way in which the prophetic history creates a troubling social and cultural dynamic within the community of IHOP KC. In our evaluation, a healthy version of IHOP KC would be one where the validity of the prophetic history, like all prophecy, would be freely weighed, challenged, and called into question. We feel that Bickel is considerably double-tongued in his statements about IHOP KC's reliance on the prophetic history. He claims that IHOP KC does not base itself on the prophetic history, but in private, at staff meetings and conferences, Bickel continues to elevate the prophetic history, use it as the controlling narrative of his ministry, and refuses to renounce those elements which have failed to come to pass, function inappropriately, or were given by individuals whose behavior fell severely short of that expected of a Christian minister. To such end, we would hope that IHOP KC would be a community where leaders, faculty, and staff possessed a variety of views as to the validity and importance of the prophetic stories, Bickle's heavenly visitations, and the various prophetic voices within the early days of the movement. If Bickle has deemed confusing or unhelpful some stories he shared in the 2002 Encountering Jesus series, which was the prevailing version of the prophetic history used for training from 2002 to 2009, he should make abundant public statements as to this fact. If Bickle does not, as he says, have a mandate to proclaim a third world war, then he should make abundant public statements recanting his claims. He claimed in the 2002 Encountering Jesus series that he was blowing the trumpet in this regard, and in his statements at the 2008 One Thing Conference, he publicly shared his movie screen vision of tanks rolling across America. It is unreasonable for Bickle to claim that he is not a preacher of such things when he is on record openly making such proclamations. Regarding the nearness of the return of Christ, Bickle says, It is simply my opinion, not a revelation prophecy, or doctrine, that Jesus may return in the lifetime of people alive on the earth now. I publicly say that I may be wrong on this, and that it is just my personal opinion based on my observations of the biblical signs of the time spoken by Jesus, the apostles, and the Old Testament prophets. On this point, we refuse to accept Bickle's flagrant hair-splitting. An opinion based on observations of biblical signs is exactly what any other teaching is, an opinion informed by evidence. There is no functional difference between this so-called opinion and any other doctrine of IHOP KC, despite Bickle's obligatory qualifiers and insistence to the contrary. Once again, we point to the harmful function this statement has played within forming the culture of IHOP KC. We see Bickle's document entitled On the Varying Importance of Eschatological Beliefs as a Movement in the Exact Wrong Direction as he places belief in the coming of Christ, in this or the next generation, in the lowest tier of importance. But he still finds no problem with Forerunner being the primary identifying marker of IHOP KC and its members. We simply find it dishonest for Bickle to attempt to have it both ways. We would ask, is Bickle willing to evaluate the effect this opinion has within IHOP KC, given the high esteem with which that opinion is held? Is he willing to change his behavior based on the negative effects which this opinion has had on the environment of IHOP KC? It is hard for us to take Bickle at his word when senior leadership of his ministry have teachings entitled, How can you know you are living in the last generation? And the prevailing belief among students and staff agrees with his opinion. The use of the word forerunner repeatedly within the naming of many departments, curriculum, books, and how many students and staff self-identify shines a clearer light on the real way in which this so-called opinion functions within the culture of IHOP KC. Despite Bickle's claims that he is only stating his opinion, we insist Bickle strongly consider the role this opinion has played since the bulk of IHOP KC has taken it as dogma. In our evaluation, given the damaging role this opinion has played in forming the unhealthy culture of IHOP KC, we would ask it to be publicly acknowledged as unhelpful in its sharing decease. In conclusion, we do not expect our course of action to be endorsed by either IHOP KC, Mike Bickle, or Midwest Ministers Fellowship. We are not asking for their blessing or approval. We hope, only, for MMF's understanding. 
Coming to the table has been one of the most difficult decisions many of us have made. In the year-long series of communication since we first began the public discussion of our grievances with IHOPKC, we have attempted to handle our disagreements as respectfully as possible. This meant coming to the table once more, after all the personal interaction, meetings, and conversations we each had with leadership as we left IHOPKC over the previous years to share afresh our critique. Our final analysis is this. We see no context in which Mike Bickle and IHOPKC will make the types of holistic changes which would satisfy us to the point that we would not feel a duty to warn against involvement and association with IHOPKC. Given this, we also see no context in which IHOPKC would let us walk from the table to proclaim our public warning without accusing us of violating some Christian ethic or protocol. Since we have little faith in Bickle fundamentally changing and no scenario where IHOPKC leaders will feel we satisfied the proper protocol, we are making the decision, not lightly or without fear and trembling, to walk from the table. While we understand our assessment and response may alienate us from those who are in association with IHOPKC, we feel the need to speak plainly on this issue. We are aware of the thousands who have interacted with IHOPKC over the years, visitors, staff, and interns. We are glad for the enriching role IHOPKC has played in their faith. Yet we are also aware of the experiences of many who were closely involved, who spent years with IHOPKC, and whose experiences drastically differ from those whose involvement was peripheral or whose relationship with leaders was non-confrontational. Given this context, it is our assessment that IHOPKC is an independent, fringe, accountable in name only, high pressure, manipulative, spiritual group, with an unhealthy leadership culture, with a self-justifying pattern of mistreating people. We find that IHOPKC leadership is unable of the self-reflection, contriteness, and reasonability to engage in the type of reform we are asking. In all the talks of willingness to meet and make the changes recommended by MMF, never once has Mike Bickle taken responsibility for his role in creating the unhealthy environment at IHOPKC for perpetuating its abuses, or for allowing the mistreatment by its leaders to continue. This is, in our estimation, unacceptable and the ultimate sign of the futility of our continued dialogue. In closing, we would simply like to state that we hope we are wrong. We pray Mike Bickle and IHOPKC leadership would take to the task of rigorous reform with zeal and diligence. We would hope we would not have to question the sincerity of their actions or wonder at the motivation behind their conduct. Rather than responding in a minimum way, we would anticipate bold and brave action to correct the unhealthy aspects of IHOP Casey's culture. If Bickle is truly sincere about apologizing, do so not at a private staff meeting, but in a full-page Christianity Today ad, in a full press release for Charisma. Publish your apology as widely as they have published your praise. We want to stress that we do not see the changes we are asking for to be either easy or quick. We expect these concerns to be a front-burner issue for the next three to five years. We are simply asking IHOPKC to make that sacrifice. Until they do, we can have no relationship. We can have no reconciliation. It would be inappropriate to even talk about such things until many years of right behavior have passed. Right now, we only have a public duty to warn. It is our hope that Mike Bickle and IHOPKC will make the right choices.